The sermon has been written. Most of the preparation for worship has been completed. There's just a few bits and pieces to tidy up, but it's time to have a quiet afternoon at the manse. And then the phone rings. You receive a call from one of your members who has been advised by Police Scotland to tell you that they have been arrested, bailed and told not to go near children. This person has a designated role in the congregation that involves contact with vulnerable groups. What do you do? The Kirk session, despite the minister's promises to finish early, went on and on and on last night. You meet up with your closest friend from the session for a coffee the next day, and no doubt you'll identify the point where the discussion had reached its natural conclusion some 45 minutes before it actually did. Over coffee, your friend makes a passing comment that his daughter has been sexually abused by an older child in the community. What do you do? Or at the pastoral care group, you catch up with who has seen who. A member of the congregation has disclosed that he lashed out and hit his mother, causing bruising and a cut on her nose. You're taken aback. This is someone whom you know and trust. His mother has dementia and has separately told her visiting elder that she has been unable to access her money, but trusts her son, who is her power of attorney. What happens next? Quiet Saturday afternoons in the manse and Kirk sessions that are short, sweet and to the point may be rare, but issues regarding safeguarding are not. That very moment when the phone rings or a friend discloses an occasion of risk, harm or abuse, and you suddenly realise that safeguarding is not about filling out forms or ticking boxes or just about children in the Sunday school. And at that very moment, you might wish that you had paid a little bit more attention when your congregation safeguarding coordinator invited you to training through the presbytery. In one calendar year, the safeguarding service can typically process over 2,000 applications, most of which are for volunteer roles within congregations. By the same token, the safeguarding service can typically receive 500 referrals over the year relating to matters of physical, sexual, emotional, psychological and financial harm and neglect. Safeguarding service is a vital but often overlooked service within the Church of Scotland. Relegated to box ticking at inspection of records, standing items on the Kirk Session agenda that don't often report, SG7 and 11 forms training, training and more training overlooked, not considered, until the peace of a Saturday afternoon is disturbed with a phone call, or a friend discloses information, or you witness harm or neglect yourself. And that is the very moment that safeguarding comes into sharp focus. And that's what we as a service are committed to. We want to be able to help individuals and congregations work through the processes of ensuring the safety of all of our people in trying to prevent occasions of harm, neglect or abuse and acting appropriately when these occasions are witnessed or reported. But none of this is easy. And many of you feel uncomfortable when being asked to tackle safeguarding seriously especially when a particular concern has been reported. We are often dealing with people you know and trust, and it's awkward. Sometimes we, as a service, will offer advice and a number of options which a congregation may choose to take. But it's absolutely imperative that we are also abundantly clear when a particular course of action must be taken. That's why this year we wish to make an amendment to the Safeguarding Act to ensure where advice is given by the Safeguarding Service and is framed as an instruction, it must be adhered to. This follows the advice of recommendations from the investigation report on safeguarding in the Church of England and the Church in Wales, published by the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse in October 2020. Over the last 18 months, we have been identifying areas of the safeguarding service 
that need review and improvement. And I want to just spend a little bit, a bit of time speaking briefly about two of those. The first, survivor engagement policy. Understanding the needs and the experiences of survivors of abuse is crucial for an organisation that is open to learn, welcoming and committed to providing a safe system for all those who are a part of it. In light of the recent independent inquiry into child sexual abuse report, which rightly places real emphasis on the importance of survivor engagement, this is the time for us to really consider how we can appropriately and safely implement a furthering of our, safe, our survivor engagement policy to include working with survivor participants. However, we need to be very clear, this is a difficult road to tread. As a church, we need to be cognizant that involvement on improving survivor policy for survivor participants without proper preparation and consideration, could well place survivors at risk, as the process of participation may itself entail hidden potential triggers for that individual survivor. There is also a need for an honesty of our involvement. We need to ensure that those working directly with the survivors have the professional capacity to make the policy a good policy. In working with the survivors, we would need to enable the survivors to have as much as possible a positive experience of being heard. We should aim to ensure that there is a clear transparency in our processes. We should be able to display clear evidence of having listened to and learned from the survivors' comments and that the views of the survivors have been rightfully considered by us. The URC and Methodist churches have most recently engaged in such a process and we would hope to learn a good deal from their experience. And handbooks. Currently we have available six different handbooks on safeguarding in the safeguarding section of the Church Scotland website. These are each intended to provide clear and detailed advice on different aspects of safeguarding. However, we are aware from feedback that one handbook with clear, easily referenced sections would be preferable. We want to be able to empower congregations to exercise good safeguarding. And if we can make information necessary more readily accessible, then we will. This follows on to our ongoing work in trying to provide online forms, particularly the well-known SG7 and 11 forms. In October 2020, a deliverance at the Assembly was passed instructing IT to prioritise the development of a system through which SG7 and 11 forms can be processed electronically and report its progress to this Assembly. This has been a long process going way beyond October 2020. And while I regret that I do not have anything to report further on this matter, the Assembly trustees have assured me that this still remains a significant priority. As a service, we recognise the need for a robust IT system that suits our needs. But we also recognise that face-to-face -face meetings in the coming months will help us all to ensure that the correct IT package is delivered on behalf of the Safeguarding Service. The Safeguarding Service relies on the professional experience of its membership. Since 2014, we have been blessed with the membership of Caroline Deeran, who was appointed to Vice Convener in 2017, and then served one further year as Vice Convener to ensure continuity. Caroline has brought a wealth of experience from her professional background in social care, and she has been instrumental in delivering training policies over the last four years. As she reaches the end of her term at this assembly, I would like to place on record our thanks to Caroline for her dedication and enthusiasm, and wish her every blessing in this next chapter. Finally, 
the Safeguarding Service is committed, absolutely committed, to ensuring a safe church for all. And we all have a part to play in ensuring that this is the case. And I would like to thank all of you for your contribution in making sure that our service remains a robust safeguard against harm. So thank you.